Hey everybody, this is John with another installment of Think Culture. And today, after something like a year of a break that I've given you from having to interact with me at, at any level, we are returning. We're back, we're back to our project. We will resume today, Spheres, Spheres Trilogy, Trilogy, Bubbles Volume 1, um, after a long break. So probably you don't remember at all anything that was said before. That's great. That's all well and good. <laughs> um, you know, that's fine. Me too, in the, in the, in the production of this and the future videos I'm going to be doing on this, um, on this series, I'm mostly working from notes, you know, I'm not reading the whole thing. Uh, every, uh, hopefully I'm going to be making a video a week. I'm not going to be reading like 80 pages in this every week or whatever. Um, I was doing that and then I wouldn't have any time to do this. So I'm working from notes, um, memory and, uh, secondary materials or whatever, um, where that's necessary. But anyway, we're getting back. Um, we're going to do this. We're going to get it done. I have, I think figured out how to sort of streamline this process in a way, um, make it more efficient. I think my life is more in a place now where I can be more efficient. Uh, so I think that this is going to go well. I think I should be able to make basically two videos a week. Uh, I'm thinking one of them will be a continuation of this series, and then the other one will be different topics, whatever I feel like doing, basically. Uh, I might be revisiting uh, old books, other philosophers, or just talking about current events, trying to provide some kind of more thoughtful analysis of what's happening in the culture. Than, um, than people will typically find anywhere. But anyway, for right now, what we're going to do is we're going to get back into this book. And the chapter we're in is called The Primal Companion, Requiem for a Discarded Organ. What is the discarded organ? The placenta. <laughs> Actually, just as a bit of a, of a um, sort of prologue, I just learned today <laughs> that... I cut the umbilical cord of both my sons, and somehow I didn't know that the umbilical cord is actually not attached, like, directly to the mother. It's attached to the placenta. Um, and not only that, but to sort of this theme that we've been on with the connectedness of the infant and the mother. If you remember, just briefly, right, Bubbles, this is his volume on microspherology. These are microspheres. Those are the spaces of sort of encapsulation we, we create for ourselves um, symbolically uh, in terms of establishing our immunity in a sort of intimate relationship with another. And we started, you know, with like romantic relationships and that pairing. And then we went to like, you know, faces, friendships. We're moving down, you know, sort of microscopically into our microsphere, microspheric arrangements, sort of smaller and smaller and smaller pairings. And eventually we've been pushed back all the way into the womb. And um, like he talks, if you remember in the in the interfaciality chapter on the evolution of the face and like the way babies' faces look and how they're designed to sort of appeal to the mother and, and uh, derive you know, a kind of intensity of compassion and things like that from the mother, that there's this kind of reciprocal development over time. Um, to that point here about the placenta, uh, what I discovered is that, very interestingly to me, the umbilical cord is an organ that emerges from the infant, right? In the development of the fetus and the womb, the infant grows an umbilical cord. I always thought, that the umbilical cord like came from the mother and then attached or whatever. Um, no, it grows from out of the fetus. The placenta grows from out of the mother. <laughs> and the umbilical cord, like, and the placenta is attached to the mother. It's attached to the, to the uterus. And the umbilical cord grows from out of the infant as the placenta is emerging, <laughs> you know, from within the womb itself. And then the umbilical cord, you know, penetrates the placenta, basically connects the infant to it. And that is how, obviously, all of the nourishment, all of the nutrition um, comes into the baby. 
I also just learned <laughs> that um, it's not necessary to immediately sever the umbilical cord. And again, this is going to go along with some of the themes in this chapter as we get into them. But um, you, you like don't have to do that. It would just dry off and uh, dry up and come off on its own. And apparently there have been some sort of movements recently to not immediately sever the umbilical cord. Um, you're going to see, you know, as we get into this chapter, as you're reading the chapter along with me or whatever, if you are doing that, you'll come to see why this is significant. <laughs> but anyway, so the discarded organ is the placenta. And he describes this as the first dyadic pairing. This is the, the primal microspheric unity. And remember from our chapter on um, no objects, right? This is a pre-subjective unity consisting of sort of two poles. And in this chapter, he's going to describe the, or rename, let's say, the placenta as the with and the fetus as the also. And he's doing that to sort of defamiliarize what's happening here um, in order to re-mystify <laughs> what's happening here and like push us back in in Lacanian language I would say sort of like he's trying to push us back into the real of of um of experience of 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 the bodily of this kind of pre-subjective um existence that we have and he wants us to sort of understand it and experiment experience it uh at least sort of intellectually or whatever, but not as an object of scientific inquiry or investigation. That's the negative gynecology stuff. We need to be able to both stand outside of and stand within this kind of developmental process. Right? But anyway, he talks about how the placenta is this sort of first primal companion. Right? It's, it's your first other pole in a dyadic unity. And it's there with the infant. It's it's providing them comfort and security. It's it's so, what they feel, you know, wrapped around them. It provides them warmth, all this kind of stuff. They develop alongside each other. And again, the nourishment and stuff like that sort of comes from the placenta as well, right? But um they're bonded, you know, they're a they're a pair. Again, when you give when a child is born, right? we ha we try to repress <laughs> the uh the reality that there are always two births right the the fetus comes and then there's the placental afterbirth the the preg the the birthing process is not completed until both of these things are evacuated from the mother and um so they belong together there's this kind of originary pairing right and the fetus has the, the experience of, of the fetus of the also within the womb, within this primal unity. Uh, like its universe has consisted of this placenta, right? That's what it's been feeling. It's been nurtured by, it's been comforted by. And immediately after birth, what do we do? We take the baby, we cut the umbilical cord, <laughs> and discard we, as as medical waste we discard the placenta and now that discarding of med as medical waste um he's going to explain historically remember he has you know his method is phenomenological and it's also um poetic and it's also uh genealogical right so he he gives us a kind of genealogy of treatment of the placenta and so he's like, at various times in history, people have reacted to the placenta differently, thought about it differently. It's been buried under trees. It's been, you know, put in an amulet or something like that next to you. It's been uh, kept, it's been eaten, different things like that, right? People have always been trying to figure out sort of what to do with the placenta. And um, as this kind of double of the baby. And he talks about like ideas like the doppelganger and stuff like that. The idea of a tree of life, where many people would sort of plant a tree on top of the placenta and or umbilical cord. And this sort of symbolized the the life, the growth and development of the child, because he's born and it dies, right? 
in order for the child to enter into the world and become start to become subjectivated, individuated, his twin must die. Right? It's a birth and a death <laughs> simultaneously, or something like that. Um, because it's it's precisely the death of a monadic pre-subjective unity of placenta and fetus, and the birth of John, <laughs> right, as an individual as you know on this individual process etc and so forth um so people have always uh people in the past used to ascribe significance to the placenta they used to care about it they used to try to take care of it they did something special with it it was revered or imbued with a kind of you know mystical significance or something like that and he's like today in this sort of age of bourgeois individualism individualism in this age of planetary technicity the absolute objectification of everything now we've come to a point where we're like no this is an object it's waste <laughs> uh we need to maximize efficiency cut off the excess get rid of it throw it away it serves no purpose to us etc etc and um he takes this like we we pushed ourselves back to our kind of primal existence right this unity within the womb this is the earliest stage at which we can think about human life let's say and so we pushed it all the way back here and that's what existence amounts to right and from the moment of our birth right this 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 dyad is to sort of torn asunder and half of it is destroyed in the name of scientific rationality right in the name of efficiency and he takes this kind of as a metaphor for um you know I, I would say for demystification in general but but also for our treatment of people as you know atomistic individuals right the rejection of of companionship of of sort of fundamental um connectedness and intersubjectivity and things like that um and this is what he calls uh placental nihilism right we think of the placenta as nothing but the placenta is not nothing, it's not waste, it's not some extra, it's us, it's fundamentally um, part of us. And the function that it has is, as he's been describing within, you know, the sort of spherological unities, it has this immunological function, right? It shelters and takes care of us, it provides security, it comforts us, etc. It completes us, it turns us into a whole. An individual is not a whole, it's a part, right? The individual is is I'm not a solitary individual or human being at the at a fundamental level according to Slaughterdyke, right? I'm a pair at, at sort of minimum, at absolute minimum. I'm a pair. And so if I'm being treated as an individual, as though the one pair in this part constitutes the whole thing, then this gesture, this sort of orientation is, you know, placental nihilism. It's it's viewing sort of ha it's this hemiplegic procedure. We treat John as all there is, and all this ex all this other stuff that is a kind of necessary, supplementary, augmenting, um, fundamental part of my existence is nothing, right? This is nothing to us. And so, what that's going to contribute to ultimately is this kind of existential sense of loneliness and isolation this kind of fundamental alienation that people experience in the modern world um it all goes back to <laughs> our you know kind of this freudian language it all we can trace it all back to not the trauma uh traumas that our mother subjects us to or whatever but the traumas that this fucking doctor subjects us to um you know, and or dad, cutting our umbilical cord, throwing the placenta away, <laughs> right? This is this sort of fundamental tragedy, this fundamental trauma. Psychoanalysts don't push back far enough into the etiology of our, of our psychological constitution and our identity. They need to go further. They need to go into the womb. That's, that's where we need to, um, to plant ourselves in order to figure out what has gone terribly awry, <laughs> right? And um, the placenta, you know, it's this immunitary, has this immunitary function. And there's also an argument here, which is you, you can relate, I think, to something like the petit objet in 
uh, in Lacanian psychoanalysis, this lost object, the lost object that falls out of the other, right, um, which which produces incompleteness and then stimulates desire. And so for Lacan, Lacan, right, your whole life, your desire is 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 moving forward. It's stimulated by lack, right? The lack of possession of this extra, this surplus, whatever. I think that the way Slaughterdyke here is talking about the placenta, we can understand it sort of in, in a similar way. And what he says ultimately is like all throughout human, all throughout your life, you are always creating these spheric unities with other people, ideas, things, whatever. You're trying to establish these relationships in which you're hoping that this other thing you're going to pair with can can supplement you in a way that makes you whole. It can complete you in the way that the placenta can. You're looking again for this sort of originary unity and wholeness that was lost. Um, and normally, like in traditional societies, it's lost also, <laughs> but, but it's mourned, it's taken care of, it's registered in the symbolic universe as important, right? We engage in a kind of war on the real, we cross it out, it isn't registered, it doesn't become part of the symbolic or the imaginary or anything like that, we just try to repress and deny it totally. And that creates a lot of different pathologies um, in terms of our sphere formation later on, right? We have to have some kind of context <laughs> to understand that a pairing can take place, you know, that we need an augmenting other, that we need a companion. That we don't stand alone as some solitary individual because that doesn't work it doesn't work you have depression loneliness isolation etc or he's going to go on to say like this sort of the two pathologies are like that and totalitarianism <laughs> those are sort of your two options right and i've talked about this in other videos actually where um like one of the things that's very interesting about liberal political philosophy is that individualism and universalism sort of belong together right the totality and the one belong together and they stage a kind of <laughs> you know two-sided war on particularity on communities on groups on traditions um as soon as everyone is isolated they're nothing but a you know a, a single individual freely choosing whatever then they're all the same and they can all be combined into a totality right then you can uh, interact with them all, control them all, affect them all as a totality. And so he thinks that it's like, you know, these kind of um, pathologies of sphere formation, of spheropoiesis, that produce social pathology and political pathology and stuff like that. But that we really need to understand that the source of all this stuff is in the womb. <laughs> that our original spheric dyad, our spheric unity, is the... Uh, is self and placenta and we're always looking for this augmenting pair for ourselves we're always looking for someone for someone something to stand in for the placenta and complete us and it never will we can't accomplish that no one is ever going to be as good as your placenta was <laughs> right so, so don't even try i know mean, you should try that's sort of the point you should try but <laughs> you should expect that it's not that it's not going to be perfect. You're never going to achieve that kind of wholeness. And again, from the Lacanian perspective, what that amounts to is castration, right? Here, too, Sloterdijk tells us about castration, but he talks about umbilical castration, and that the navel, um, which is interesting because we have terminology like navel gazing and stuff like that, and we mean it as a pejorative, Whereas he's like, no, 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 navel gazing is great. <laughs> we need to pay more attention to our navels. We need to view our navel as the sign of this kind of fundamental separation from our, you know, completing other, right? And actually think about that and understand it rather than, you know, avoid navel gazing, discard, throw away the placenta, don't ever interact with it, don't think about it, all that kind of stuff, right? Navel gazing is good. We should engage in it. That's what we're doing right now for, for precisely that purpose. We want to be able to reconnect <laughs> our sort of fundamental unity. One thing I wanted to do 
Uh, I think that's okay as like a kind of general introduction to the stuff I was trying to, you know, to what to to this topic. After that, I was thinking there's some passages in here that I had highlighted that um, are really good, and I think they contribute to the conversation uh, greatly. And so my hope is that. I can read a little bit of it to you and maybe discuss it a little bit as I read it to you or whatever. I'm just going to go sort of like through highlight, highlighted section to highlighted section to highlighted section um, just to kind of finish up here. I think I've given you a, a general synopsis that's pretty good. Oh, except for the excursus too. Um, the excursus. No, I, I've kind of included that. This video is basically on chapter five and the excursus. And... Um, just trust me that basically both of them are covered here. But anyway, um, so I'll read some of these sections to you um, and then maybe talk about them a little bit. If you don't like that idea or whatever, then you can go ahead and turn it off. I've already given you sort of a basic, um, I think, uh, proficient, uh, sufficient synopsis of what's going on in those chapters. But anyway, um, so the... And, yeah, okay, so the medical establishment took it upon itself to ensure, like a gynecological inquisition, that the correct belief in unaccompanied birth was firmly anchored in all discourses and emotional dispositions. So there's been this cultural forgetfulness, right? And you can think here about Heidegger, like the forgetfulness of being. You should also be thinking about Heidegger when we talk about the with, right? Heidegger has this terminology of being with, being with others. And he thinks being with others is a fundamental existential ontological element of, of human beings. That you can never not be with others. Isolation, individuality, is an ontological impossibility. Right? Here, Sloterdijk is exploring sort of the same theme, but he does it in a much more concrete way. Um, in a much more like psychological, developmental kind of way. Um, and yeah, he's saying there's been this movement to repress the idea that the placenta is something, <laughs> is something at all, means something, means something at all. Um, this also connects to stuff in like his um, critique of cynical reason, by the way, because he has a big section in there on medical cynicism and the, the medical cynicism and its effect on society. And that meaning something like, you know, the demystification of the body. This is just inert matter and it doesn't you know it's it's meaningless and so i can like fucking just cut it open and take out an organ and do it you know throw it away <laughs> none of this matters at all um that kind of attitude is what we're talking about here with respect to the placenta bourgeois individualist positivism established against weak resistance from exponents of soul partnership romanticism the radical imaginary solitary confinement of individuals in the womb the cot and their own skin throughout society Robbed of the second element, all single humans immediately become mothers. <clears throat> I find this to be a fascinating uh, thing that he's saying. Here. Um, I'm still trying to understand it, really. Uh, but again, I think it has to do with this. It might have to do with like trans phenomena and stuff like that. The the in Lacanian psychoanalysis, the objet petit a drops out of the mother. Um, big O other, big O other with the M in front is how it's generally represented. And that's her, you know, um, that's, you know, this, that's, she doesn't have the penis. <laughs> she lacks something. She lacks the phallus, uh, which in the imaginary register is the penis. And so there, she, there's a fundamental incompleteness there that you have to try to grapple with. Um, and you try to satisfy the other by obtaining the phallus and things like that. I think here he's talking about something like giving up the search for the phallus or the assumption that you have the phallus, that there is no such thing as a lack. I don't know. It's a, it's interesting, but um, I haven't totally, I think, reached the bottom of what I think about it. Um, but they all immediately became mothers, and directly after that, a totalitarian nation that reaches through its schools and armies for the isolated children. The founding of civil society began an age of false alternatives, in which the only choice individuals had, ostensibly, was that between reveling solitarily in the bosom of nature and embarking on potentially fatal power adventures with their peoples. Um, then he talks about Rousseau. Rousseau was the inventor of the friendless human, who could only conceive of the augmentative other as either 
a direct maternal nature or a direct national totality. With him began the age of the last men, who are not ashamed to appear as products of their milieus and isolated examples of social psychological laws. That is why, since Rousseau, social psychology has been the scientific form of a contempt for humanity. So this is, again, locating um, this sort of pathology of placental nihilism in the ideologies of modern, liberal, bourgeois, individualist um, uh, thinkers. Where, on the other hand, as in antiquity and popular traditions, a space was left open for the soul's double in the cultural imaginary. We've closed, we've closed that off. We've closed up that space. Now there's no space for the soul's double. This means nothing. You're an isolated, atomistic individual. You always were. You always will be. <laughs> pairings always come later. No, says Slaughter. Like, pairings come first. Pairings are primary. Um, the archaic intimate means in itself it means in itself affords the subject's distance from two primary forces of obsession that became manifest in the Middle Ages. Obtrusive mothers and totalitarian collectives. And again, you might think, you know, the coddling of the American mind type stuff. The, the all men. Who was who it recently that said, um, I think I was watching Tucker recently and he said something like, there are a lot of men that are, uh, what are these, uh, what are they called? Disappointed cat ladies or whatever. I forget what the phrase was. <laughs> These lonely cat lady spinsters or whatever. There's a lot of men that are like that too. I think he's, he's he identified Pete Buttigieg <laughs> as one of these um, childless cat ladies. And I think that's this. You know, we're all we're all becoming mothers. There's this bottling phenomenon. Um, there's a kind of androgynous androgynization of the sexes. You know, an elimination of um, of sexual dimorphism. And, you know, dimorphism is the two. It's a consideration of the pairing. If we go away from thinking of humans as fundamentally paired, then what do we have? We have the mother with the penis. <laughs> you know, is what, is what I would say. It's not what Slaughter Dyke's saying here, but that's what I would say. I don't know if I ever made a video on... I think I did make a video on train stuff, so I probably talk about that a little bit there. But, yeah, we're the two um, primary forces of obsession that become manifest in the modern age are obtrusive mothers, and totalitarian collectives. But whereas in the most recent part of the modern age, the with space is annulled and withdrawn from the start through the elimination of the placenta, the individual increasingly falls prey to the manic collectives and total mothers, and in their absence, to depression. You need that, right? So he's saying this is like the temptation towards fascism or something like that. This is its emergence too. If you're this lonely individual, right, and there's this lack, this desire that's that's building up in you, and there's no means for its satisfaction, because we don't have the conceptual tools, we don't have the symbolic framework to understand ourselves as as needing a companion. We think we should be these strong, isolated individuals. Then that leads people to identification with the nation or something like that. This kind of giant totalitarian collective that they have to throw themselves into manically, right? Um, from that point on, the individual, especially the male, again, this is interesting to think about why he means, why is he saying especially male, is driven ever deeper into the fatal choice between an autistically defiant descent into loneliness and devourment by obsession communities, whether in pairs or larger groups. If individuals do not succeed in augmenting and stabilizing themselves in successfully practiced loneliness techniques, artistic exercises, written soliloquies, for example, they are predestined to be absorbed by totalitarian collectives. The lonely modern subject is not the result of its self-choice, but rather a fission product from the informal separation of birth and afterbirth. I, mean, I just think this, this stuff is great. To me, again, like he has this kind of... Um, poeticism <laughs> in his writing that I that I really appreciate and it's it's very fruitful like you could take any one of these passages and sort of spend a long time thinking about them I've thought about doing that where I make a video and I just take a paragraph or something like that and just like talk about it for 30 minutes or something um that might be easier for me to do <laughs> but uh, I don't think it'd be as entertaining or something if the subject were to practice what one contemptuously terms naval contemplation, 
navel gazing so i you obviously should have translated it that way um in the west it would only find its own unrelated knot it would never comprehend that for its entire life the severed cord in the imaginary and psychosonorous realms inevitably points across into a width space in terms of its psychodynamic source the individualism of the modern age is a placental nihilism. Just awesome stuff. The one who performs the cut is the first separation giver in the subject's history. So that was me with my kids, for example. Through the gift of separation, he provides the child with the stimulus for existence in the external media. And, you know, he goes from the, the media of the womb, you know, blood and fluids and whatever, and... and and the placenta as a as a kind of media he goes from there into the world right into the world of air germs whatever <laughs> basically the air um and that is sort of symbolized by and affected by the person who cuts the umbilical cord the father again all this stuff has like important psychoanalytic um connections which is interesting because he always condemns psychoanalysis but i think you know, he's, he, <laughs> I don't think he should. I, I think that, you know, he should be understood more as kind of like supplementing or up, updating um, psychoanalytic, uh, a psychoanalytic perspective. Um, but yeah, so I, you know, I, I began the individuation process of the child. Um, the father cuts the child from the mother, cuts the child from the placenta, which is, you know, that's you know, how it is. Um, maybe. It, we could talk about different things with that, but um, that's fine. It's healthy. It's not pathological, perhaps, until it, this double, this pair, this twin, this companion is just flushed down the toilet <laughs> and forgotten. Um, never to be seen again, never talked about. <laughs> you have this scar on your body that indicates the, the need for the beginning of your, of your duality with this other that is just lost, cut out of the symbolic universe. Modern individuals who have themselves already grown up in the regime of placental nihilism have lost their competence to perform adult gestures. They, norm they normally seek nihilistic refuge in gestures of sh shameful disposal or hurried aid. To its disappearance, they act as garbage disposal men for Eurydice. Hastily and formally and cluelessly, they exterminate the afterbirth and destroy Orpheus in the beginnings of the melody that would be born from his free asking after the other part. Hence the muse's primal scene is covered up among the badly delivered subjects of modernity. The freedom to lament the lost other is smothered by dullness and unceremoniousness. This again relates to what I'm talking about, like the connection between um, the placenta, this or originary dyadic union and wholeness with the placenta, and then its removal, your separation from it, the relationship between that and the the little a, <laughs> uh, the objet petit a in Lacan that stimulates desire, right? Here we're talking about the Eurydice being taken away, being taken from Orpheus, and this stimulates his desire, right? It's his mourning for and his love for and the desire that is prompted by the loss of Eurydice that organizes his life and that and that he sublimates into something beautiful like music or whatever. If we cover up, if we annihilate, if we forget Eurydice, we don't get the music, <laughs> right? We don't get the sort of fully developed uh, Orpheus. That's something to think about. Um, I think there was at least one other thing I'd highlighted that I really wanted um he talks about the symbolization of our dependence right our fundamental dependence and, and need for the other and that's where he gets in the in the excursus here the sort of tree of life image right the tree of life is this organic scene of our need and our dependence and things like that um as well as being sort of concretized in terms of people planting trees of life and stuff like that and um he thinks of you know ultimately that it, let's say it's a concretization of this immunitary function that culture is going to give us right the culture is supposed to symbolize 
our separation and our um, our desire, our, you know, our lack and our desire for complementarity and things like that, give us a kind of cosmic picture of ourselves as not fundamentally alone, the universe not as fundamentally meaningless, etc. Like a culture is this kind of immune system. The tree of life symbolizes this kind of immunitary function, and um, you know, we're now we're replacing it with you know artificial technological sort of um immune functions instruments of immunity that don't work <laughs> that don't work very well um they separate us from the real you know there's this constant sort of separation disconnection from the real from the body from you know the, the sort of organic connectedness that we have you know that we've been discussing like with the baby and the mother um successful symbol formation which again, this sounds like you're talking about psychoanalysis, but successful symbol formation produces this kind of immune function, right? And that's what cultures do. So he manages to connect like biologically, sociologically, and culturally, psycholo I say psychologi and psychologically, like they all get connected through this metaphor and through this kind of genealogy. Um, I think we can probably Call it there for now, and we'll pick up with chapter six next time, or the next video that'll come out will be something else. But then chapter six um, will come later. <laughs> but all right, that's um, that's it for now. Don't forget to not just react, but think culture, and expect a, a different type of video at least within um like three days or so i'll probably record it like immediately or something if i have time here and then just set it to release in a few days try to you know help the algorithm or whatever but anyway don't simply react but think culture